Hey everybody, <laughs> welcome to the Go to Charles video blog, uh, available at gotocharles.com and anywhere BuzzFeed posts podcasts. Uh, today, this is technically episode two. Um, I have done one other with another guy, and so um, my special guest today is William. William and I met in very unusual circumstances, and as we got to talking, um, we found some common alleys and decided to discuss uh, those on the blog, and since I was already actively working on it, I'm always looking for interesting people to interview and creating videos um, that stay on YouTube forever is is a good thing. So, um, William, let's start out with the introductions. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about, about your background and uh, and maybe briefly on what, how we met. Sure. Uh, I was uh, born a long, long time ago on the East Coast in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And that's where my parents and my great grandparents and all came from Italy and Ireland and England. Very, very uh, European background for me. And uh, was raised in Philadelphia, you know, learned things about the streets back in the day, graduated in the 80s, been around long enough to watch the 80s, have come and gone several times now when it comes to music and fashion and things like that, which is funny. But I uh, moved to the Pacific Northwest uh, at, a, at a young age, back in 1992 when I was a wee lad and having my own young kids and having established myself here in uh, Washington, um, I love it. I love it here. I uh, used to teach at the University of Washington. I'm a musician by trade um, and a teacher, performer, and <clears throat> self-taught producer because, you know, just like what you're doing here, for those who have the passion to share, the technology is out there. And all you got to do is learn the basics and move on from there and connect with people. And I think that's literally what we're doing right now. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I have five sons. I was divorced back in 1997. Um, a lot of where my income and businesses have been started from a young age. Uh, my family are all musicians and artists. Uh, so I did notice, though, at a young age that they were all starving artists. You know, everyone had a different job other than what their passion was, which was fine. But my grandfather and my grandmother on my dad's side, um, my grandmother was one of the Rockettes from uh, Radio City Music Hall. And my grandfather was a professional singer in New Jersey, like in Atlantic City and places like that. And they met and got married and had their sons. And then one of their sons was my dad. So, uh, you know, genetically speaking, I've always been into the arts and music and things like that. Uh, recently, uh, during the COVID year, had a car accident and everything in my life that built up to that moment just came crashing down and changed. And I think that's one of the ways we uh, connected through someone else, which we can talk about at a later time. But um, just telling you about the things I went through sparked again this passion that I had in my 30s about reaching out to other men and humans in general to basically say, hey, we can connect through this technology and not be alone in what we go through. You know, every single person I meet has some kind of story about being alone or going through things that are traumatic or difficult to deal with, you know. So I think coming out this way from Philadelphia was a way of getting away from my family and starting something fresh with my sons, which I actually am grateful I did because it's a beautiful area to say the least. I yeah. like your background, by the way. Yeah, thanks. I love the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, my background has to do with uh, where I want to be come New mm -hmm. Year's. Um, anyways, uh, you just brought up something. That the reason we connected was because we have so many things in common, uh, just like your divorce in 97. That's when I got divorced. You're right. We were both single parents um, of children. Um, had wives that were that were an issue if you will um and uh and ended up raising our own kids it 
and this is also another way to connect to the younger generation, you know, that may be experiencing that. And uh, Will, William and I are going to have another podcast we're going to do on just the specific topic of um, child child raising and what 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 is right to do with the children. Um, I believe both parents should always be involved, um, except for in certain cases. So. Um, my background is far different than his. Um, I was born in Washington State, where he's at right now, and um, uh, literally at the hospital. It's in Everett, um, and uh, my my life begins at the age of eight uh, because I was hit by a car at the age of eight, and uh, um, I was either told that I was never going to walk, or um, or that's what I believe because I had two holes in my knees and uh and ended up by high school being like a track star um and then uh my family dates back three generations at boeing all in the pacific northwest to all the way back to 1956 and so aviation was in my blood i got to fly a, a 1947 boeing stearman biplane um at the age of 14 and by the age of about 16 or 17, my dad won employee of the year at Boeing, which I don't even think they do anymore. And uh, we got to fly a 757 flight simulator. Um, nice. So that's the start of my story. Um, and then I joined the military, served for 10 years on an aircraft carrier in the air wing um, and miscellaneous shore stations, working helicopters and 14 different platforms, really. Um, and... Uh, then was separated due to the fact that um, I wanted to retire, um, but was separated because I had custody of my kids and I was in a deployable squadron, so I could not take care of them. They, they had no place to go with that quote unquote 24 hour notice. Mm. So I got out and I've been in aviation engineering ever since um, I got out. I was promoted my first year uh, with Textron and um, now I'm in New Hampshire, which is not indicative of my background because my I don't intend on staying in New Hampshire, but I'm on contract here and took an interesting contract working on ships. So um, so that's a change of pace for me. And it's exciting for me to to grow and do something different that other people haven't done. So that's, yeah, absolutely. that's a great background. I have a little bit of aviation. I did about nine hours of uh, pilot classes. That's awesome. I believe Boeing Field. Yeah, uh, about ten years ago, and I started coming back and forth to Hawaii over this last decade. <clears throat> First and foremost, I know this is going to sound crazy, but you know, one of the stable people in my life as a child was my grandmother on my dad's side. That would be his mom, and she would put this giant conch shell up to my ear and say, "You hear that? That's the ocean." And I knew what the shell meant in the ocean. And it was just a totally tropical thing for me. You know, as you could see, I have tropical plants growing on my walls here. But I started coming back and forth to Hawaii because I wanted to uh, become a pilot out there. And that was a little dream that I had. So I stayed out there for a while. So that's another thing we have in common, which is really neat. Yeah, I love how many hours you got? Uh, like nine nine okay. only passed out once with the other pilot. <laughs> so he was like you want to feel some g's and i was like not really and i just remember waking up yawning like what happened he's like that's what happened and i was like okay <laughs> it was the only time i ever passed out in my life it was, oh i thought you were at the stick okay no 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 he wanted me to feel what it like if we were going into a spin how difficult it can be for a pilot to get out of that because of what it's doing to you in the moment and you know whew. Ugh. that was an interesting moment yeah, very cool. I think that, that may have made me not want to continue I'm not really sure what happened there but but anyway I'm glad that you asked me to be on and I'd like to do some uh, podcasts with you and maybe make this the one the first one with me and I have a lot of topics and for me one of the things that I am becoming really passionate about again out of necessity and just the peace it's bringing is connecting with other people who have similar interests, who are going through the same type of things, who sometimes feel like they don't have that connection and don't have an outlet. I saw a woman put up a reel uh, recently on Instagram 
And she said, how many of you men have someone to cry to or call or talk about what you're going through? And like just man after man on this reel was like, I ain't got nobody. I mean, right. just go home. I lay down, I deal with my emotions because, you know, traditionally speaking, a man is supposed to be like, have perfected his emotions to not have to have emotional things go on, which I think is so such a biased thing in an, in an age where people are demanding equality. I think that men should be able to feel and women should be able to think if women are going to be you know, finally, we're equal enough in the workplace where there's all these restrictions on, you know, you're not allowed to uh, come on to each other in sexual ways. And HR uh, is there for all that. I think that in every way, men and women should be equal. And and especially for men, the, this more fundamental tradition that they don't show their emotions, and t- in my way, is an imploding of toxicity on yourself. And so having this ability to connect with you and try to introduce you to some of the friends I've had over the last few decades who are passionate about, you know, growth as a human being. I mean, not even not even getting into the spiritual aspect of things, but if there is a creator and there is a purpose to everything we're going through here, we are in this moment, human psychology and mental and emotional health must play some vital part in spiritual growth or we would not need this connection whatsoever right and you and i both agreed so much on so many topics over the course of the last six months and it, and it's it's just uncanny how much uh how similar our lives had been you know we talked about your birthday or your divorce being in 1997 mm-hmm. that commonality i didn't even know about yeah uh, but, you know, us being single fathers and, and having to pay child support while we have uh, while we have custody of the kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're going to do a podcast with another gentleman named James Christensen, who actually won pro se without a lawyer um, custody of his child. I personally believe both parents matter. Um, I think that they should be in the picture unless there is a circumstance much like mine when my ex-wife was a drug addict well, still is a drug addict. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that they should uh, intervene on those types of scenarios. And you had mentioned something earlier. Uh, the I want to bring up the CASA, the court appointed uh, state advocate or something like that. Right. There definitely are not enough CASA people out there to support the amount of divorces that happen per year. So the children nearly always get um, get a specific ruling from the judge based on the way uh, child support has been handled in the past. Right. So that's where we were talking earlier. And I was basically saying that generalized laws are not fair to very personal and and unique experiences one thing is there is no one size fits all in this situation right Right. uh you've told me a few times some of your stories about your ex-wife having been on drugs and the difficulties that created i um my ex-wife had a drinking problem and i don't know if she still drinks now and i don't know if she got it under control but back in the late 90s she was having a really difficult time and the kids were young we were both taking care of them three and a half days a week. I I was doing my part. I think I was doing more than what most dads do. As a matter of fact, I become a really good cook because of it <laughs> and learn how to do the dishes immediately. So they don't pile up. I've tried to teach my sons that as well, but um, I, I, there's two parts of that for me that I focused on. One was her telling me her mom was an alcoholic and that she was, very opposed to drinking because of it. But the caveat that came with that was, she said to me, if I ever start drinking and it gets out of control, I need you to intervene, even if I don't like it at the moment. And I was like, wow, that's, you know, that's an intense thing to tell someone. And years later, it's exactly what I had to do. And it started a series of events that went very difficult for me because I didn't get representation properly 
and some untruths were told that make me made me look more accountable or worse for things that we were going through. And the court overlooked her drinking, you know, and uh, I was telling them how important that part was because the kids were uh, I, I think one of my favorite moments is when the sheriff or the marshal's office called me and said, we we're going to come arrest you because your children aren't in school. And I said, well, I don't even have custody of them. So why don't you arrest their mom who got custody of them? And then I'll take them and get them back in school. Right. And so that was the theme that I went through over and over again. For some reason here in Washington, for her, if you were the mom and you say certain things, then you're automatically awarded custody. And uh, that didn't fit uh, my uh, situation very well. It really didn't. And so... I was in a different relationship and the girl and I had a business going. My kids were young and I think that affected my ex-wife because I don't think that she thought I was healthy enough to move on. And mm -hmm. I did. I yeah. did because not only because as a human being, I wanted to live my life. You know, I want to experience why, why am I here and do my moments matter? But not only that, on a practical level, now I have these children who absolutely need me just to survive and get what they need. And uh, I've had someone in my life over the last few years that I told my story to, and I explained to this person how difficult being a single dad of five sons was and how much I had to work just to cover the basics. Right. I think we talked about that before too, you know, do I pay the rent or do I pay my car insurance? Do I put food on the table or do I buy diapers? I mean, can I wrap my kid in, in newspaper and um, <laughs> gorilla tape right. you know, and just take that off, wipe it up and whatever. And so it, you know, I mean, I get it. It was my choice to have children and I was very young. I'm not saying I regret it because I love them dearly. Years later, we wound up gracing the same stages as a band, a, a rock and roll band here in Seattle that Nirvana and Soundgarden and every other band that ever was in the grunge scene or anything famous here in Seattle, they played the same stages. And I can say, and I'm boasting when I say it, I did that with my sons. That's something that we did together, wrote original songs, performed, played out. You know, we're not doing that at the moment. I'm in different projects and I have different music going on, but I can say that that happened. And when I tell my friends about that, they say that's quite an achievement. Yeah, we didn't become famous like uh, Metallica or whoever, but we did something as a team that most fathers and sons don't really get to do. And people thought I was just like the older uncle because I'm 55. I don't vibe like a 55, whatever that means, you know. Right. Um, I don't I, I've met a lot of uh, young ladies over the years being on stage who like age is just a number. And some of them say that because they kind of want a daddy in their life. And some of them say it because they actually intellectually mean it. And you just right. have to know who's saying what. Mm -hmm. But You know, I just uh, I just realized that sometimes you got to intervene. Sometimes you got to step up to the plate. And I tried to step up to the plate like my ex-wife told me to do. And I met with a lot more resistance than I thought I was going to because a person who is not doing their first step in any type of re rehabilitation, which is admitting whatever their problem is. It could be alcohol, it could be drugs, it could be Sexaholics Anonymous, it could be with food, it could be anything, right? Right. Uh, if you don't admit that you're going through it, then there's nothing to change. You're in denial. You can treat people around you terribly. You can just toxically pour sludge through your mouth onto people because you're just in that denial phase. And so in that moment- um, Or not even recognizing stage. Absolutely. And, and, and in that stage, you can say and do anything to anyone and hurt people because you're in such denial of your own pain. How could you even feel what you're doing to people? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So that is one of the things that has eased my mind over the years is that when someone is coming at you in a toxic way, rather than taking what they're saying, because, you know, there's some intent to hurt you as a way of defending themselves, right? In those moments, the best thing you can do is remember that person is in so much pain that they have to do that to you. And that is a good way of not having to take that personal anymore. But right. as far as inter intervening for my children with my ex-wife, years later, 
when we were on stage once, she actually thanked me for intervening. But what the court did to me between the moment of intervention of, hey, you told me to step in if you were drinking, you're drinking. You told me like you didn't want to drink because you saw your mom ruin your family. And here I am, your ex-husband telling you, we both love these kids. They are a precious part of our life. You can't go down this road. You told me to do this. And it still kind of came out not so good at first for me. <laughs> yeah, I wound up. Uh, yeah, let's just say representation is really important. And I'm really looking forward to being a part of the podcast with your friend. Seriously, because yeah. and I want to I, I, I suffered in ways I didn't need to suffer. I, I couldn't get my passport because of this child support stuff. And I had my kids more than any father I know. I was with them. And like I said, how couldn't how would I have gotten on stage to play music with them live if we weren't spending good quality time with each other? I'm not saying that we don't have our dysfunctions and our issues and all like that. Everyone does. But I am in contact with all of them all the time still. And I love them dearly. And as a father of only sons, which is very unique, um, men have this. I don't want to use say aggressive, but it's definitely a male energy to get out there and start a business, grind and get your life together. One of the best things as a father I can do for them right now is to just support them. Just say hi on social media, call them up, text them, make sure they're doing well. But they're they're men, they're 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 forging their identities and they do not need to at their age to fall back on someone in any kind of codependent way so it's it's a fine line as an older parent now to say hey i'm here if you want to talk i'm here if uh, you need anything but i know you're out doing your thing but i want to know i want you to know that i'm here to support you doing your thing and that's really when you're a parent like us of children who are now adults it's pretty much all you can do right you know you can spend time with them but you still have to give them that freedom to do whatever it is. Excuse me for you know bringing it up this way, but whatever God intended them to be, you got to step aside as a parent and let them do that and just be a, a cheerleader Correct. and say, I'm here. If there's ever an emergency, something like a car, God forbid, you know, an accident, a broken leg or whatever, then obviously I'll be there in the practical way. But in any other way, I'll just be supporting you doing your thing and it's it's not an easy step for some parents to be able to get to that point yeah, I'm you, and I came to, you, you and i came to a realization i think i got mine my kick in the midsection about five years earlier than you but you come to realize that there has to be an empathy within you as a human being um and you you don't rule this world at all you, mm. you have zero control over what happens from day to day the only thing you have control over is yourself. Exactly. And the way you respond to people. And that come, goes into what I just said. If you can understand that tidbit that you just gave, that jewel, in with when someone's coming at you and attacking you in what seems like a toxic, hurtful, purposeful, hurtful way, mentally or emotionally, you have to take a deep breath, hold on, even if they're saying something that's trying to trigger you, and say to yourself, what level of pain must that person be going through to allow it to get through their circuit into me to try to do that to me? Right. And um, the only other thing you can do is just get away from situations like that. Right. I mean, honestly, um, I didn't, I mean, I've, you know, I think I asked the same questions as a young kid that most of us do, you know, who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going to go when I die? You know, does consciousness uh, continue after the body is done in death? Because as I got older, I started to realize that death and rebirth is happening in everything on the planet, including the planet itself. So it's natural for us to go through these things that we go through. But, you know, like everyone else, What's the purpose of while, while I'm here? And I think right now it's brought me to this grounding level uh, after knowing you for six months or so and finally starting these podcasts 
I would like to do a, a podcast in the future with you where I tell, talk a little bit about what happened to me in uh, March of 2020 and up until like literally this moment. You know, I can touch on it now, but maybe go into depth because uh, there's a few aspects of it. Well, on, about... your, on your last statement, I had a comment uh, where you were saying about rebirth. Um, death brings on rebirth of people and stuff like that. I had a friend who was up there in Marysville where I was at. Um, who had a son was living with her. He was just 17 turning an 18 and was getting ready to go in the military. And I had chatted with him on, on Facebook chat, uh, checking up on him because his mom worked nights and stuff like that. Well, his mom got home and um, she found him dead in a chair in his oh. room with a gunshot wound to the head. Oh my God. And he was very, very good with guns. Him and I went shooting all the time and everything like that. But he was just a young kid. The cops said that it was suicide. I did not. I, I don't believe or accidental suicide, I think, is what they said it was. But to be honest, the way he knew how to handle guns and stuff like that, I, I just don't I don't I, I can't see him doing it. It, mm. it, it had to be some sort of accident. But. That being said, on the backside of that tragedy was a family who the mother was divorced and there were other kids in the picture that were a long ways away. They were like in Michigan mm. or something like that. Well, in that tragedy, um, she was estranged from those other two kids and the ex-husband, completely estranged. And that death brought that family back together. Yeah. Oh, I see where you're going with this. And, yeah. and, uh, I had, I had to remind my friend, I, I had to remind her, you know, look at, look at all the positive that came out of it. Maybe he came to this earth just for that very purpose because God already knew what was going to occur. Right. So, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, that's, that's deep. I mean, it's really deep because, uh, the hardest thing for any of us to get through is the actual mental and emotional pain of and trauma of events like that. I don't think you fully get over them. I lost a precious pet two years ago. She died in my arms. And the first thing I thought was, if it's this hard with a companion, like a, a wolf dog that I had, very loving wolf dog that brought everyone in my family together, her name was Alchemy. <laughs> really cool name. But um, if it's that hard to deal with that pain, I can't even imagine like losing one of my sons or something like that. I mean, it's right. just unfathomable. And, and I already intellectually know that I would have to move on. I have a, a, a business partner right now who uh, two, a few weeks ago lost his mother. And he's holding it together. Uh, but I, I can tell, I, I talked with him and I said, look, I'm your friend. I'm your brother. I'm a coworker. I'm here. I care about you. I can't think your thoughts or feel your feelings, but I want you to know that there are people to support you getting through this. So do your best to feel it and not let it negatively uh, affect any other parts of your life right now. Because a lot of times when we go through loss, will go through a temporary depression or it might trigger actual other types of illnesses that we might have. And you can go into a tailspin and go down real quick on something like that. And it can, you know, he could lose his job after a few weeks, you know, if he doesn't take the, the right uh, leave or whatever. So just me saying that I could tell that just sitting with him every couple of days for a half hour and having eye contact and talking to him has been something stabilizing it's just the energy that we share i i, I just don't want to get all weird but i think i believe consciousness has some form of electrical magnetic field and when we're thinking of people they receive what we're thinking or feeling you know it's a technology that we don't understand there must be some spiritual technology that we just don't have instruments to quite understand yet we got about nine more minutes left um, in this meeting. Uh, have you heard of uh, the 4D versus the 5D? Uh, no. Okay. So three-dimensional, 3D, right, is what we see as human beings. Mm -hmm. And there's 
trend that I read about that we are transitioning as a human race um, into a 4D type of world. And it's going to take a series of, of years, decades. There's no real time frame to it for right. everybody to eventually convert into that next dimension. And then there are certain people who will even be in the fifth dimension before the fourth dimension people catch up. And so it's really interesting and technology I think is part of it. I mean, we all, just like you had never used a zoom. I couldn't believe that through COVID. <laughs> and well, now I'm going to probably use this as a tool for drum classes too. Right. Yeah. You make recordings of that. And yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, but anyways, I think technology is part of that transition into a 40 world and things like that. And I mean, we can have a whole discussion just on that subject content. Absolutely. Yeah. I believe I've read, that. A, I've read about, I read about a hundred, hundred plus books a year and I, I do them on audible. And the reason I do that is because audible will suggest something similar to the Correct. content that I'm listening to. So, right. So, and I have, I had a, when I first started Audible, I used, I had a wide range of things I listened to. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's plugs like I gave you to read the four agreements, you know, mm -hmm. uh, by John McGill Ruiz, you know, it's a simple book. It's got four rules of life that if you can do them, if you can do those four rules, I think he's added a fifth, but if you can do those rules, you'll have no problems in life. Just Interesting. plain and simple. Each one of those principles is you have to apply it to everything you do. And it does and it doesn't, you don't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have triggers if if you do what he says to do. Mm. I'm gonna have to check this out. Maybe if I get this book in the next couple of days, we can actually talk about it on one of the podcasts. Yeah, it's it's a very, very popular book. Um, I, I mean he sells. I, I couldn't even imagine how many cells, but I see it pop up on my Facebook feed quite frequently. So, wow. yeah, it's really interesting. Well, I, I think, you know, for me, even doing this in this moment is part of this new birth that I am going through because, um, I mean, 2020 was a weird year for a lot of people. You know, the COVID thing just kind of made like, it, it, it kind of like divided everybody, obviously for viral reasons, you know, everybody wasn't trying to be around each other. But for me, it was uh, a little harder than most people because in March of 2020, I got in a pretty bad car accident. And I had this really cool little 1988 Porsche that I had taken the last seven years to fix up. And I was able to drive it while I was fixing it up. It was my hobby. I was really enjoying learning about it. And uh, finally had it completely done. And on March 6th, 2020, I got the tabs renewed and it cost $108 even. And if anybody out there knows that in Hinduism and Buddhism, the, the number 108 is a very sacred auspicious number that comes into your life uh, when uh, the number that what it represents is about to come into your life. Did so you say, uh, I'm sorry. Did you say safe? Safe. Is that the word you use? Safe. The number is safe. I don't know this. Oh no, of sacred. Oh, yeah. sacred. Okay. Yeah, in Buddhism, there's 108 beads on the chanting beads that they chant on, and so Buddhism and Hinduism have a lot of, of similar connections. So anyway, my tabs were 108 dollars, and I thought, oh, how auspicious, how spiritual, how awesome. Well, eight hours later, uh, I, I find myself in front of an RV with the front of my car smashed. Uh, this gentleman was pu pulling out his RV onto uh, the highway in an illegal way and created a wall on both sides. I, there was nowhere to go. And the lady behind me swerved and smashed into it next to me. Ne needless to say, I had uh, a year and a half of physical rehab and my wolf dog uh, died a few months later of complications. And it was horrific to go through. I couldn't sleep for months uh, because of the pain while I was uh, physically healing. 
uh, long story short, I look back now and I thought, how funny that number, you know, so sacred, it comes into my life. And that night I almost met death mm -hmm. and lost, lost everything because the COVID year was not only difficult, but I had a concussion for six weeks. And then I went through all this crazy stuff for months that I can't even begin to tell you, but it was a very low part of my life. And, uh, from that struggle, things have become, uh, started to change. Like I'm physically better now. I have a new wolf dog. Uh, I have great employment. Uh, my music is beginning again. Yeah, I have my music studio set up and my drum classes are going on. But it was so difficult to go through that day by day by day and not feel like uh, I wasn't going to die from it. So I understand when people are going through difficulties that a lot of times all we really need is just someone to understand what we're going through and sort of be a cheerleader. So I, uh, Charles, wanted to thank you for having me here today. And I would really like to do this again next week or sooner if we can. Okay, yeah. Uh, I'll be happy to share the link on all of my social media. All right. And, um, you know, what would you like to talk about next when we get together? I did like the idea of your pets one, um, how, how pets impact family. That one was a good oh, idea. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Absolutely. So I, I don't know. We'll, we'll have a conversation offline, but uh, we're about ready to run out of time here. So um, we'll wrap this one up and I'll schedule another meeting for us to get together. Maybe I can get James in to come and talk about the child support stuff. Um, I got to find out his availability and schedule. Yeah, so, that'd be wonderful. Yeah, that'd be an awesome, that'd be an awesome recording. So anyways, this is the Go To Charles uh, podcast and we will see you on the next one. Take care.